so my name is Sierra Wolf. I'm an occupational therapy doctor student with Virginia Commonwealth University. Um, prior to this fall semester, I was working in the field um, in schools, skilled nursing, and outpatient adult pediatric populations to help individuals with physical um, disabilities get back to all the activities they want to do. As part of the doctorate curriculum and final semester, um, I was assigned to take on a doctoral capstone project with Team Triple Helix and assist them in the development of an assistive technology outreach program. I'm Nate Lavender. I'm the head coach of Triple Helix, Team 2363, and the president of our nonprofit booster organization. Um, we were very lucky to have to grow this connection with Virginia Commonwealth University to uh, begin having a, a you know, doctorate student in our, in our program, helping us find better ways to uh, connect the, connect the, uh, the resources with the team to the potential needs in the community for assistive technology. Uh, so what is occupational therapy? Occupational therapists help individuals who have been ill, injured, or maybe were born with a disability participate independently as possible in all the things they need or want to do. Um, so we consider small activities like brushing your teeth, um, taking a shower, preparing a meal, we call those occupations. Um, so the word occupation doesn't necessarily relate to just work as we consider it in the general language. Um, our domains of practice include ADLs or activities of daily living. These are basic activities like I mentioned, like brushing your teeth or taking a shower. Also includes instrumental activities of daily living. These are a little more complicated. These are things like driving, preparing a meal, childcare, or pet care. We also um, treat individuals for issues with rest and sleep, work, education, play, and leisure. So in cases where healing is slow or maybe um, the individual has lifelong challenges, occupational therapists also recommend, um, provide, and sometimes create assistive technology solutions for their clients. Um, anything to make the activity or task easier for that individual. It's important to note that given the clinical constraints and insurance regulations, a lot of these AT designs happen to be very low tech and simple, um, but that's not to say that in more specialized organizations like the Department of Aging and Rehabilitation, high tech solutions are also available. So what is the prevalence of disability in the US? Um, actually one in four adults in the United States have some form of disability. This is a very high number. Uh, and in the US, um, as of 2016, only 35.9% of those individuals between the ages of 18 and 64 were actually employed. And if you compare this to 76.6% um, of able-bodied individuals who are employed, this is a really low number. Um, the reason we bring up employment is employment is really essential um, to occupational fulfillment. Not only does it provide us um, income and uh, insurance access, but it also provides us opportunities for socialization and a sense of purpose and community. So when you work in AT, you will be exposed a lot to individuals who are asking for AT solutions for the workplace. So what is assistive technology? Well, AT is defined by the 1988 Tech Act as any piece of equipment, product, or system whether acquired commercially, off-shelf, modified, or customized, that is used to increase, maintain, or improve functional capabilities of individuals with disability. It's important to note that the 2004 Individuals with Disabilities Education Act, designed specifically for schools, defines AT much the same way. However, they specify that AT must be used for curriculum access and educational purposes. AT can encompass very low-tech items like Velcro, screwdrivers, extended handles, and handcuffs. And it can also encompass higher technology like myoelectric prosthetics and power wheelchairs. Um, so disability and assistive technology, what is the real need out there? So only one in 10 people in the world actually have access to assistive technology that could significantly improve their independence, usually due to financial or availability concerns. Not only is there a significant need for assistive technology in the population, there's also a significant deficit of individuals who are skilled enough to, to provide assistive technology solutions. Other challenges with assistive technology access include um, the uniqueness of every disability. So each person is different, has unique needs. No two disabilities are, can be considered the same. Many assistive technology needs are beyond the scope of what can be provided uh, in schools and by insurance as well. 
Something that is important to mention is the prevalence of what we call assistive technology abandonment. A high percentage of users actually end up abandoning their assistive technology device after acquiring it. Um, and factors that increase the risk of assistive technology abandonment include not considering user opinions, so not viewing the assistive technology user as the expert in the design process, difficulty acquiring the device. A lot of assistive technology users go through rigorous, um, rigorous actions to try and, and get a hold of assistive technology devices. Poor device performance. This is something really important to keep in mind. Your device needs to be as efficient or more efficient than what the user can do on their own with their limitation. So for example, if you were, let's say you were missing your right arm. If you think about right now, if you wanna go grab a glass of water, all you have to do is really think about it. But if I give you a device for your arm and it takes multiple steps to have to reach out and grab that glass of water, well, at the end of the day, you're just going to end up using your left hand instead because it's faster and more efficient. Why well, have a device to do that? Um, so this is really important to keep in mind. It needs to be efficient and it needs to work across multiple contexts. And then also changer, changes in user priorities. Um, this is important. You've got to keep up with the assistive technology user. You need to check in and follow up. Also providing appropriate training and modifications throughout the, the AT process will help mitigate assistive technology abandonment. And this whole idea really speaks to um, the notion that commercially available assistive technology devices do not work over the long term for assistive technology users. So assistive technology as the cure. Um, before we get much deeper into this presentation, I want to challenge preconceived notions about disability and the environment. Um, our views on disability are often shaped by mass media and limited interactions. Um, if you think about the movies we watch, we have so many shows out there about an individual who has a disability who no longer wants to live life, who doesn't feel fulfilled until an able-bodied person comes along and saves them. This is not the reality. Individuals with disabilities are more than capable of living fulfilling, happy lives on their own. I also want to challenge our notion of disability. Is disability a physical or mental impairment or is it an environmental impediment? And when we approach assistive technology, what we're considering is access to the environment, not fixing the individual. So what I want individuals to consider moving forward is the impact of your environment on disability. Uh, in occupational therapy, we have a saying that you are only as disabled as your environment makes you. Um, so if I give you a tool to do a task as efficiently and as well as I can, are you still disabled? And the answer is no. Um, so moving forward, I want you to consider AT as a solution to an environmental handicap instead of a fix to an individual. So why occupational therapy and the FIRST organization? Well, FIRST provides the technical knowledge and design processes to create safe, unique, and customized design beyond the scope of the general OT practitioner. Um, and they provide this in a, in a very welcoming educational environment. Um, what I've learned is that STEM tends to focus on assistive technology from the end product perspective. Um, in occupational therapy, we have a unique understanding of the patient, their occupational needs, as well as any physical or cognitive barriers. And from our perspective, we focus on AT um, from, from the perspective of the, of the end user. So the reason FIRST is the right organization to take on this, this challenge is because FIRST is the best in class high school youth STEM organization that has a, has a mentor basis. So with existing FIRST teams, with resources behind them, such as you know the capability to build a, a you know world class competitive robot, and and the mentors to uh, help guide students through through the challenges of you know of competing with a robot, um, these these are the groups that are able to uh, find these really compelling problems that they could they could try to tackle in their communities. Um, the initial collaboration with First and VCU began in 2017. And to speak about how that collaboration began and the outcomes of the first year, we'll be hearing from Patty Labrador, who is an occupational therapy professor and has been the faculty mentor overseeing this project. Hi, my name is Patty Labrador, and I'm an occupational therapist and assistant professor and program director of occupational therapy at Old Dominion University. So my knowledge of the first organization led to a 
really satisfying and productive relationship between um, between occupational therapy and um, F FRC robotics. The final semester of the doctoral program involves a student's engagement in in a capstone experience. That capstone experience is designed to help students develop advanced skills in areas like research, administration, leadership, program and policy development, advocacy, education, theory development, all, all advancing the skills of um, a student to prepare them for advanced practice in occupational therapy. Um, and there, it's also designed to help students be prepared to meet um, the health and wellness outcomes for individuals, groups, and populations. So from the very get-go, the design of the capstone experience is to immerse a student in an area where they can step in, demonstrate leadership, demonstrate creative approaches to the needs of our um, of, of individuals with physical or, or mental functioning needs and um, and design new and creative and innovative solutions to those uh, problems. The summer of 2017 I had a student that was really again interested in technology and his particular interest um, was in the area of 3D printing. And he, and he wondered um, and began to examine how 3D printing could improve the quality of life for individuals with disabilities. By the end of that fall semester, it was becoming clear that we were not able to identify a site where that could take place. And that's where the sort of the wellspring of ideas around integration between occupational therapy and FRC began to take place. So in the spring of 2018, we made the determination that um, Jason would, instead of looking explicitly at 3D printing, would look more widely where not only did Jason um, expand his technology knowledge, but also expose students that are themselves learning about technology in the FRC program to build their understanding of the disability experience and how their skills and technology could meet the needs of, um, of a community of individuals that have access and participation limitations. So the way that we designed that experience was that his uh, the first part of his capstone experience was to literally embed in the program. Um, he embedded in the whole design and build phase where he um, followed uh, and, and served as a non-technical mentor to the team to help him learn in, um, in parallel with the students that were building the robot. He also used that time to teach um, individuals about the disability experience. So he, um, he met with students, he did training, he helped them understand about, um, about the disability experience and about how limitations affect participation and access to the kinds of meaningful activities that we all engage in. As the competition phase then began, Jason spent his time embedding now in the community. He met with a number of stakeholders that, um, that provide service um, and provide access to individuals with disabilities throughout the community. He formed, formed strong relationships and partnerships with these organizations and from that partnership grew a series of um, opportunities to provide the um, 
to, to design and provide adaptive equipment to individuals with unique and um, specialized needs. Jason brought his ideas to the team and the students and the team mentors used their combined capabilities to develop um, a number of, of adaptive designed equipment to support the needs of individuals in the community. Jason's experience ended with some really um, amazing outcomes. First, Jason learned the technologies involved in design and build. He learned how to be a mentor. He learned team leadership. He, um, he did an environmental scan of the Hampton Roads area to determine the unmet rehab engineering needs in that community. And he developed a plan at that point to help address high priority needs um, to meet the needs of individuals in that, in that community. The team um, had the opportunity to begin to learn a little bit about um, experiences of individuals with disabilities. Um, and they learned um, the, the beginning skills in rehab engineering. Um, what was really interesting as a occupational therapy educator in that experience um, was to watch the unfolding of a common language. The students, the mentors, and the occupational therapy practitioner in their midst had to discover a way to communicate um, effectively in order to use their unique discipline specific skills uh, to meet a common goal. And, um, and I think uh, as I look across the outcomes of that particular project, um, I think that that was perhaps one of the most salient and, um, and critical. Um, and I think that that's the case because it provided the foundation for the development of a second capstone experience. So at this time, we have our second student embedded in that experience. Um, and the, the history for her experience is exactly the same. So picking up from where Jason left off in the second year of collaboration, my goals included continuing assistive technology education. It's very important to stay up to date with assistive technology as the community and resources are constantly evolving. My second goal was also to strengthen relationships with community and local partners. Um, Jason had established several great partnerships in the community and we wanted to keep working with them on projects. Uh, my third goal was to continue assistive technology design and modification and then also to start disseminating that knowledge through open source learning platforms. Um, we felt together, Triple Helix and I felt um, that it was important to start sharing our experiences with individuals like you and the community at large. What Sierra has done is taken Jason's project a step further. Um, she began to expose students to not only the disability experience from a third person's perspective, but also introduce them to individuals with disabilities that are using technology to meet their occupational needs in the community. So she has introduced them to individuals with amputations, people with mobility impairments, people with cognit cognitive impairments that are using technology to help organize their lives. Um, and she too has taken taking them on a journey to, um, to develop a number of technologies to meet the needs of individuals in that community. After the second year of collaboration, we had some significant outcomes to our project. During Build Season, we created 13 assistive technology projects. We collaborated with five different community partners. We also increased the understanding of the needs of individuals with disabilities in, amongst the team members. And we increased the awareness of post-secondary opportunities for students uh, in STEM skills. And we noticed an improved sense of community and efficacy among the students. Um, and the students themselves really enjoyed the experience. As, as the head coach of the team, one of the outcomes that was very special to me is that, you know, in this 2020 season, which, you know, had this 
at this terrible interruption, uh, our, our students got to use their, their budding engineering skills in a way to really make a positive difference in their community. They, they got to, you know, have, have some, use their, use their skills to some positive effect uh, in a way that they really couldn't experience during the FRC season this year. It's important for people to learn how to interact with people who do have disabilities, though the people who has a disability don't feel like they're different. They don't feel like they're outcasts from society because they aren't. Um, much like many other things in this world, you often can't control with what you're given. And so it's just the world would just be a better place if people learned how to make it easier and if people knew about it um, to adjust certain things for not just the majority but for also the minority. Uh, after like working with AT and all this stuff I've really been able to see what the things that they go through and the challenges they face and I feel like that's helped me better appreciate how who they are and stuff like and the things they've gone through. I think it's really important for FRC students to um, to get involved with assistive technology projects. Um, just like building robots, it's a chance to design, work in teams, um, work on STEM-related projects, um, prototype, you know, come up with a design, try it, find it doesn't work, tweak it a little bit, uh, try it again. They're problem solving, they're planning their time. Um, it, it's really, it's kind of like a, a little mini robotics project, really. You know, it doesn't take as many months as a robot does, but you're still doing the same sorts of things. I think the AT projects definitely help me understand, like, what it's like to, like, be a person with a disability, because people are often, like, looked down upon or not treated the same, when in reality, they just need a little bit more help to do everyday tasks just like everyone else. So it's really helped me understand what it's like to need help and not usually have it available is another thing because lots of AT is super expensive. So I think that being able to go through AT projects has helped me understand that you can help people who just need a little bit of an extra like device or piece of technology to allow them to do things like have their own salary and everything else that normal people do. We also saw an improved sense of community and efficacy among our students. Overall, our students increased knowledge and awareness of individuals with disabilities in their community, as well as the significant impact they can make with those they've learned through FIRST. Like the people who have these disabilities, each disability is unique and should be treated as such. So that's something that before doing these assistive technology projects this season, I don't think I really thought about um, or realized. So I think that was really what had the largest impact on my perception. The way that the AT project has influenced my uh, perspective on people with disabilities is through Sierra's presentations. One of the aspects we talked about uh, was that when you're when someone is talking to a person with a disability, you shouldn't talk to the person that's with them. You should talk to the person who has a disability because they can still hear you. And it's considered disrespectful to not speak to them, to not look at them. Um, and that was something that I haven't heard before or I haven't like come into experience with. And so when Sierra had said that, it was like, oh, okay, so like treat them like you would treat any other person just because they have a disability doesn't mean that they're incapable of simple um, interactions. It greatly strengthened my sense of community and really made me feel like I was truly a part of the community rather than just a passive bystander, if that makes sense. So these assistive technology projects have really made me feel more connected to my community. It's been wonderful. My sense of community in Newport News was definitely elevated. Being able to tour different places like Versability, which is one of the local businesses in Newport News that helps people with disabilities and gives them jobs, it's definitely allowed me to see that we have tons of different people, like a huge diversity 
of um, people who are living in Newport News. And we have a lot of people with disabilities. And there are other people who are trying to help them. And working on AT projects and developing technology that could help these people has definitely helped forge a stronger bond and an understanding that we can all work together to like make sure that everybody can do what they need to do. My favorite AT project was definitely um, working with the Go Baby Go project and redesigning the cars because even though I wasn't there when the little kids received the cars, in the videos and pictures you could tell how excited they were that they just were able to move around. So, and the projects themselves were relatively simple. So when you redesign the cars, it in reality it was only a couple of switches and a button, basically, that allowed a child to now explore the world, which they might not have been able to do before. So I think that the Go Baby Go project definitely, it was definitely my favorite because it just, you get to see how excited these little kids are that they finally get to move around and interact with places that they've never been able to do before. I think my favorite was probably all of, all of our Go Baby Go cars and the ones we did for Newport News because I just really liked how by the end of the season we had like a really good method down of just how to make them and we it was just fun like figuring out where the holes are wiring it all up and I feel like it just it felt cool because we could, like we could just keep getting cars and we could keep doing it over and over again and it just it felt really cool. So on the slide we have some examples of completed AT projects. On the far left, you'll see a green Jeep that we completed for the Newport News public school system to have joystick access. We actually 3D, 3D printed the housing for the joystick and installed it ourselves. And it was a really unique project because as an OT, I really have very limited experience to things like CAD software. Um, so I got to learn about that in this particular project. In the middle is a, a bow mount to be able to uh, practice archery. Um, this was developed for Camp Bruce, M Bruce McCoy, which has a, it's a summer camp, which has a really interesting population of adults with all sorts of uh, mobility dis you know, disabilities. Um, so they have a really diverse population of adults and they wanted the ability to, uh, you know, shoot bows and arrows. Uh, and so this is a, this is a bow mount that can enable you to shoot arrows one handed. And then on the far right, we have a red Mercedes car that we modified for the Newport News Public School System. Um, the red button in the center is the stop go button. On the far top right, the green button is the radio and on the far top left is the horn. And then we also uh, inserted extended handles for steering. One of the really unique things about this car is that we modified it in such a way that it can be completely reassembled to work in its original form. And this allows parents and teachers and other professionals to then make further modifications in the future. Additionally, the students themselves came up with the idea um, for to insert the button for the horn and for the radio, because in their eyes, a car is fun if you can use all the features. Um, so they wanted to make sure that these children had access to everything that the car could provide. My favorite assistive technology project this year um, I, I believe it was probably the modifying the Nerf gun. Um, I liked modif that project because it was uh, slightly different. Um, it was kind of hard, you know, because uh, we, we learned some things. We thought we had a good solution, and uh, on a couple occasions we found out that we had to change our approach, uh, but we changed it, and uh, in the end I think it worked. So the project I worked on with the assistive technology was to make a Nerf gun that was automated that could that would be able to sit on a chair or a wheelchair um, for someone who has limited mobility. Working on that, it was fun for me because I got the opportunity to um, learn how to CAD. So for me to be able to have that opportunity to be able to design something um, with the help of my peers was very, it was very interesting to say the least. Um, so that had to be my favorite part. 
Uh, so one of the valuable things we learned through this partnership is how to make connections with community partners. Um, so one of the big ones we suggest reaching out towards is your local school system, um, specifically AT coordinators. Uh, they tend to have a lot of resources and individuals who, who are interested in collaboration. And it's a good way to get started because a lot of their AT involves more simple toy modifications. Um, also suggest looking up your local outreach programs, and this can be as simple as a Google search. Um, any assistive technology outreach programs in your area will probably have options for you to join in to help. Um, for us specifically, in the first year, um, Triple Helix started with the Go Baby Go program. They partnered with them and CATS, the Children's Assistive Technology Service. Um, another outreach program um, that would be a good resource for uh, FRC teams would be the atmakers.org. Um, they have a lot of open source designs that um, provide great practice as well as um, inspiration for future projects. Um, also look up supportive employment programs in your area. Um, so one of our partners is called Versability. They're a supported employment program in Newport News, Virginia. And they've had several projects for us that involve modifying work devices for their individuals. And that's been really rewarding. Um, and it's also provided our students with an opportunity to um, see individuals with disabilities um, work firsthand and, and, and see what they need. Um, and then also you can partner with university programs such as an occupational therapy program. Um, there's also programs like physical therapy um, that those professionals work in assistive technology too. So all that would involve is a simple email um, to their department. Triple Helix is a fairly small team. We uh, have about 20 students and 10 mentors or so. Um, you know, we, we're very lucky to have the resources we do have. Um, understanding the capabilities of your team will will be a major, you know, it's a must as you're as you you know make the choices to begin to get into AT development. This the uh, capstone experience and the relationship we have with Virginia Commonwealth University has us working with uh, OT you know OT students in the spring semester, which, which happens to align with our major project, which is the first robotics competition build, build and competition season. Um, however, this is actually a, a pretty good asset for us. Um, the, the, uh, we're a year round team, but being able to, uh, we, we, we found that we're, we're able to work on the robot project and the, and the AT projects simultaneously. What allows us to do that is, is, Good project management and the ability to, um, you know, schedule resources around around projects as they as they're needed. Um, and the biggest thing we found so we've made some mistakes in this area. Um, we have let let some projects linger too long, um, but I think what we can say is that um, with with the right attention on to on you know on project management, um, we can use our use our team resources in a way that we're able to complete projects in a timely way. Balancing the time between adaptive technology projects and the robot build, um, sometimes that was kind of uh, hectic. Um, there's always a lot going on with the build season, making and, you know, designing and fabricating things for the robot. And sometimes, you know, there was a lot going on. Uh, but on the other hand, having an assistive technology project uh, kind of in your back pocket uh, for for students to work on, it allows uh, you to give them things to do when they're not 100% utilized. Uh, so sometimes during the season, you'll have some students that really aren't 100% engaged on a robot building task. In that case, you could just swing them over to the assistive technology project and they could contribute um, on that and they could work in teams and they're going to solve problems and there's a lot of overlap between the assistive technology project and what they would normally do for a robot. The first year we built one car and the second year we built at least we would have built four cars so and we could build 16 next time. Um, we could keep doing more and getting faster and really helping more. You know having students participate on an assistive, assistive technology project is very similar, uh, just smaller scale uh, to working on a FRC robot. Of course, you're not taking, you know, two, three months and you, the design process isn't as difficult as for a robot, 
but all the other elements are there. You're still working as a team. You're working with uh, technology. You're coming up with a plan. You're managing your time. You're working uh, with others. Um, you're working in a very tight space uh, where you might have two or three students trying to get at the same, you know, piece of, um, you know, car if you're working on a car. Um, you have to do your research, you know, what's the best switch, what's the best way to, uh, to interrupt this circuit with the appropriate switch to, to get this assistive technology device working the way it's supposed to. Uh, so it's really, really, it's complementary. Uh, I don't think there's anything a, a student can do on an assistive technology project that's not going to be valuable uh, to building an FRC robot or the other way around. Another lesson we learned in this collaboration is it's really important to develop intrinsic motivation in the students. Um, so it's essential to find some way to connect with the assistive technology user, whether it's through a video, a photograph, or in-person meetings. Uh, when we did this with our projects, our students had a lot more buy-in to the project itself and could really understand um, the issues that the individual was facing. And it had a lot of motivation to help them through that. Um, Something to mention is that the motivation for assistive technology projects needs to be to help individuals access occupations. It's not to win awards, even though that might be um, a side effect to those collaborations. The main motivation needs to be to help people. Um, and I think it's really important that uh, coaches and mentors are committed to this process as well, because the students will then also commit to, to the process. It's also critically important to understand user needs when you're making assistive technology. You need to know what not only what the device is for, but where and when it will be used. A device that's only going to be used in an educational setting um, will have different parameters than a device that needs to be able to be used throughout the day, at home, at work, grocery shopping, or maybe in church. Um, and it's important to know how it will be used by the individual. So what are the limitations of the user uh, and what are their strengths? Building a robot and building AT devices are different in the aspect of when you're building a robot, you're only building it to complete a certain number of tasks. When you're building an AT device, you're building it for a specific person. And so it has to fit their needs almost completely to a T. Whereas when you're building a robot, there's no, you can go to any match on any field and it will still have the same effect as the, I guess, like the previous match you built it for. But for an AT device, it's really only made, you make it for like one set person or one group of people. Um, and so I guess an easier way to think about the difference between AT and robots is when you think about glasses, not everybody has the same prescription. And so you can't put the same set of glasses on for everyone. Participating on assistive technology projects, uh, they changed the students' um, views of in, uh, individuals with disabilities. Um, because I think when they were being, you know, before a project kicked off and, you know, we got a briefing by Sierra, um, and they talked about you know what the needs were. You could just see the kids thinking about it and, and thinking, hmm, this is you know really you know just providing a way for a person to uh, to do something that uh, it's difficult for them to do without the assistance of an assistive technology device. Uh, so you could see their you know them thinking and, and realizing that you know that they just you know individuals with disabilities just they want to just participate and, and do what everybody else does. Uh, and if we, you know, we could only uh, give them uh, a little bit of assistance with, uh, you know, a switch or, a, a, you know, modifying something uh, to make it a little better, that's a, that's a pretty awesome impact and, and, you know, a way that we could contribute. A helpful acronym we use to make sure that we are looking at assistive technology modification from the perspective of the user is the acronym possible. So P stands for practical. Does it make sense? And is it more efficient than what the user was doing previously? O stands for open design. Can it be modified further? And this is the principle we used when we were modifying the red Mercedes car for the Newport News school system. 
it's important to allow for further modifications and customization down the line. S stands for simple or stable. It has to be safe. It can't fall apart or break in the middle of when the user is, is interacting with it or it can cause some real safety hazards. Self-imposed. This is not, this is something that um, you may or may not have complete control over, but it's still important to introduce to students. And that is that no matter how great the device is that you make, it still has to be self-imposed by the user. It still has to be accepted and used in multiple environments. You can reduce the risk of your AT device being abandoned by making sure that you have fully evaluated the needs of the user and that you are communicating with them and cooperating with them in modification and development. I stands for individualized. Like I said previously in the presentation, not all disabilities are the same, so you can't treat all disabilities the same way. Um, and then broad reaching. Um, so it's important that the assistive technology device uh, be usable across multiple contexts if possible. Now there might be situations where you need a specific device for a specific task, like the supported employment programs at Versability, but ideally the assistive technology device can be used across multiple contexts. L stands for low profile. It's important to remember that the focus should be on task completion, not the AT device itself. So the device really needs to blend in with the environment. E stands for economical. Um, you can improve assistive technology outreach by making economical, efficient designs for individuals. I think when you're planning to, to make an adaptive device, um, the skills that you need in your toolkit, um, basically all the skills that you'd, you'd probably need for the whole life cycle of the project, uh, you'll have to come up with some sort of uh, requirements uh, you're going to need some specifications, etc. Um, like you're making almost anything from scratch. Uh, you'll have to make a plan of what components you're going to need. Um, and, and you'll also have to consider uh, what you're capable of making. Uh, if, if the need comes in to, to create a, some kind of uh, um, AT uh, device that you don't have the skills for, uh, you'll have to consider that and look try and find the skills somewhere else or uh, find help or whatever. Um, in this case, you might even have to act, um, interface with end users. So uh, I guess, you know, dealing with customers is also a plus. Designing and building assistive technology um, was surprisingly, it overlapped in a lot of ways with a robot, which was, which was strange. But um, the main difference between assistive technology and the bot that we build every year is that with assistive technology, there was always an actual person to consider. So it really wasn't just about what the device had to accomplish as with our robot, but who it had to benefit and how it had to benefit them. So that was a really interesting difference that often occurred. As an occupational therapy student, um, one thing I would caution FRC teams to uh, try and avoid if, all, if at all possible is um, to make sure that you're always staying in touch with the user needs throughout the design and modification process. It's very easy to get caught up in exciting ideas and things, but always make sure you're checking back in with the previous information you collected using the acronym POSSIBLE um, so that you know that you are making an assistive technology device that is, uh, that is the best it can be for that user. I would add that, you know, it's a uh... Just like in the FRC design process, you have to be willing to give up on an idea and, and iterate on, on your designs to improve them over time. So, you know, the, the advice I would give is find a way to capture feedback, if, if possible, from the user base. Um, and if not from the users, then, then from other, you know, from occupational therapists and, and other, other, you know, people in the fields and uh, be able to in incorporate that that feedback into an improved version of your AT designs. We tend to overcomplicate things and maybe design things in a way where it's a there's there's a lot more than is actually necessary. So um, keep in mind that there are always simple solutions to problems and you have to remember what your task at hand is. Maybe make sure you have an adult mentor who you know, they can be doing other things on the team. Like I know on our team, we have a lot of other mentors that are doing like three different jobs, but they're also helping oversee these AT projects. So that's a good way to avoid the pitfall of maybe not completing a 
so is this a technology project on time or it just not getting done, you know? Um, so that would probably be a recommendation I have. And that, that, that ties into making sure you have people who are interested in the, in the time to do it so that you don't, you know, make promises and accidentally go back on them. There are some times during build season there isn't much to do. So maybe take that time and work on AT because there is something to do there and you could be helping somebody. Do a little research, see what's out there. Uh, look out on the web. Um, there's a lot of, um, there's some sites out there that'll tell you, um, give you instructions on, on how to do what you want to do. Um, um, plans, there'll be plans out there. Uh, but yeah, just research a little bit. Um, and it's really, to me, it's not really that unreasonable for most FRC teams to be able to, to take on projects like this. So, some are very simple for a robotics team, and you know, some are a little bit more complex, but almost every robotics team that I've come across, I think could probably do something like this. Honestly, just look at the resources that are available. There's tons of stuff out there, whether it be on the Go Baby Go projects or just designing certain things that can help people in day-to-day -day efforts, work, um, recreational activities, there's tons of information that's already out there. So like, if you're trying to design a device, you can't ignore the, the pieces of technology and CAD that are already out there. So like, on different platforms, most, most of the time people have already designed something that could possibly do a job. So I would recommend that just look and research and see what's out there because you'd be surprised at how much is how much of the work is already done for you and how simple it can really be to help others. Make sure you as a team have time for it, enough people for it, um, and you know, look around your community for local opportunities. But my biggest recommendation for other teams that are really interested in getting involved in designing and making assistive technology is don't be afraid to do it, uh, if that makes sense. It may seem rather daunting, um, but it's not. And it, it often ends up doing a world of difference for someone. So, and it's, it's not really that hard to get started. So don't be afraid, just jump right in. Um, you won't ever regret it. It's wonderful. I'm an alumni of the first robotics competition program. And uh, when I was a student on a, on a team very much like Triple Helix, I was lucky enough to have a have a similar experience. I was able to use my my growing engineering skill set to help develop a uh, a robotic device for uh, a little a little guy with disabilities that that needed a way to move around his move around his world. You know, developing AT as a as a high school student, this allows you to really see uh, see a way see a, a future path for yourself. Uh, it, you know that a path where you're able to, you know, use your understanding of, you know, mechanical things or, or whatever the case is um, to, to really make a, make a really powerful and meaningful difference in your, in your community. As an occupational therapy student, um, getting ready to graduate and go into practice myself, I found the collaboration with Team Triple Helix to be immensely valuable. Um, I came into the collaboration with basically no engineering skills um, and learned so much uh, throughout the entire semester about how to modify devices and um, how to uh, print and make certain things and, and just like basic knowledge um, that is going to be extremely helpful moving forward uh, for me and, and for my future patients. Um, so I would encourage um, any uh, students out there who are thinking about collaborating um, to really consider FRC teams um, as a way of improving your educational experience. I think that this is a program, a, a collaboration that has a lot of meaning, a lot of value, um, can really change the, the lives of people that participate on teams by exposing them to the needs of individuals. Um, in our community and providing them opportunity to reach out and meet those needs. It also has the capability of really changing the lives of people that are impacted by health and disability, by improving their access, improving their participation um, in, in those kinds of things that are meaningful. 
And, um, and lastly, I think it really um, has the capability of changing the lives of educators um, and of, of mentors, folks that are, are working like um, to, that are working together to, uh, to find ways to advance um, the outcomes in our society. The students that I saw that were participating in the AT projects, uh, I think they gained a lot of confidence. Um, you know, when you first tell a student, you know, what the plan is, like we're going to modify a certain toy to, uh, to operate in a certain way, you know, at first they're kind of hesitant. But after you work through it a little bit with them, they find out that, hey, they, they can take this thing apart and they can, uh, you know, search for, for online references for how a circuit might be wired up or they might um, design their own part to, to work on the car, but I think it gives them confidence. And at the end of a you know, relatively short um, project, you know, a couple days or a weeks or so to work on a uh, assistive uh, technology like enhanced car, um, they see the end product and they look at it and say, hey, I, I did this, I made this thing or I, I didn't make it, but I, uh, I adapted this device. Uh, I, somebody's going to use it and hopefully, you know, improve their quality of life. And uh, I'm ready to do the next one. This partnership has a huge um, potential for really improving the lives um, and the quality of lives for individuals, groups, and our population as a whole. Um, when we can improve the outcomes for people with disabilities, we improve our society. Um, and I think that this partnership can really significantly um, uh, impact that. The second um, place I think for me that has been really hugely motivating and very exciting is to examine and to think about OT's role in the maker movement. Um, there is a lot of interest in the maker movement um, and in providing uh, technology services to a wide variety of populations and um, and I and I love this collaboration and I think that there's huge potential and I think that OTs can help engineers and engineers can help OTs in thinking about how we can work together to, to make the differences that are, that are most valuable in our society. I think it's important for students and team members to understand that what we're doing with robots is, while we might not need an 120 pound robot in our day-to-day -day life, the skills that we use, like soldering and doing electronics and designing and building things, they can be useful in day-to-day -day life in so many different ways. So, for example, if a person needs a device to help somebody, you might only know how to build a robot, but you can easily take those skills and use them to design something or create something that will totally change a person's life. And I think the last piece that is really meaningful and valuable to me as both an OT and an educator is maker pedagogy. Um, we know that when students engage in making things, whether those students are occupational therapy students or whether they are engineering students, that something changes in, their, in the way that they learn. Something changes in the way that they understand and they build empathy. And so this capstone experience has changed the way that I have been thinking about my role as an educator um, and, and the role of maker pedagogy in occupational therapy curricula. It's really important to allow students to have the opportunity to design and build assistive technology because not only does it strengthen their engineering skills um, because it really makes you think outside of the box and think maybe in a different way than FIRST has allowed you to, but it also, I think, greatly increases their capacity for empathy and their relationship with their overall community as well, which is a really 
beautiful and cool thing to see. I also invite any occupational therapy educator that's interested in this capstone experience to uh, to reach out to me and the team to to um, to to learn from this example and to and and to share um, experiences that they may have had in um, in a maker related um, capstone experience.